Job 31. This is Job's basic last word, sort of as a, I sort of pictured a, a, a trial and, and the lawyer is giving his closing statement. In this case, the defendant is giving his closing statement. Um, and there's a number of things he brings up, and it's interesting what he brings up first. So uh, we will actually uh, spend our time this morning on the first four verses and then pulling from that context uh, applications to our own lives. So Job 31, verses 1 through 4. I have made a covenant with my eyes. Why then should I look upon a young woman? For what is the allotment of God from above and the inheritance of the Almighty from on high? It is, is it not destruction for the wicked and disaster for the workers of iniquity? Does he not see my ways and count all my steps? Sort of a paraphrase of that reads like this. I made a covenant with my eyes not to look with lust at a young woman. For what has God above chosen for us? What is our inheritance from the Almighty on high? Isn't it calamity for the wicked and misfortune for those who do evil? Doesn't he see everything I do and every step I take? So, he made a covenant with his eyes. Uh, why then should I look upon a woman? So let's go back just briefly just to read what we learned from the get-go in uh, Job chapter 1 where uh, God says in verse 8, um, And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that fears God and escheweth or shuns evil? So uh, this, is, this is the man Job. And uh, as he is giving his closing arguments of defense, uh, he says, I'm a righteous man. Now, we can, we can cringe a little bit at someone being so bold in some of the statements that Job makes. But when we understand the context of all of this, and, and I would say as a, I think any of us as New Testament Christians have in the New Testament, if we, someone stood up and gave a testimony in the words of Job, no matter how godly and righteous they were, we might think, but I wish you could put that in a little bit more of a humble tone. Well, I'm not going to fuss with Job over this. I just want to say to us, uh, if by the grace of God we have won battles and we are steadfast in fighting battles and we want to give praise to God for his amazing grace that has enabled us to win battles, hallelujah. But, uh, so, but I'm not going to fuss at Job. Because I know what God has said about him. At the same time, I know that to get to the end of the way, Job is going to be quite humble. Uh, and he's going to make a, a good confession. So don't pull this out of context and read a riot act uh, against Job because of the way uh, he put it. But uh, he's, he's on to something here that is very significant. Uh, and if this long chapter dealing with the various ways in which he has uh, fought and won battles, uh, his first one is dealing with how he has guarded his eyes uh, from lusting after young women. Um, is this not an important indicator? of righteousness in our hearts and lives? And is this not something that we 
secretly fight with. I think I've shared before of a young man that I was riding in the car. Uh, he would ultimately go and be a missionary. At this point, he was not married. And he just, we were talking about something. He said, he said if a Christian man who's married lusts, I don't believe they're saved. I didn't say a word. Because uh, I don't have a perfect record. And I wasn't ready for a lecture on him giving me the way of salvation. <laughs> well, a year or two later, I had the privilege of performing their wedding. And they had a good marriage. And the Lord took him home at a, in his 40s, having an incredible battle with cancer, left behind uh, four children. But a, a couple of years into the marriage, we were riding along. And he began to pour his heart out. As a married man, he had lusted, and it just grieved him. Well, hallelujah that it grieved him, uh, whether, whatever the sin is. So um, when a man, a quote here, when a man places enticing, sensual, lust-inducing images before his eyes, it is a form of foreplay especially considering that it often or frequently causes some level of sexual arousal in the man. So there's some strong words here in the scripture to, guard, to help us to guard our heart to how serious this is. In Proverbs chapter 4, uh, verse 25 through 27, let your eyes look straight ahead and your eyelids Look right before you. Ponder the path of your feet and let all of your ways be established. Do not turn to the right or to the left. Remove your foot from evil. So there's some things to do and things not to do. Uh, remove your foot from evil. No ifs, ands, or buts. Don't look to the right or the left. I, was, a number of years ago, I was coming into Gallatin uh, up, up at the square Stopped at a stoplight, and it was summertime, and some young, attractive, ill-clad ladies were walking across in front of me. And all of a sudden, I realized I need to focus on the red light. Look straight ahead, not to the left or the right. And so we understand the power of a right focus. And sometimes you, you don't have a choice about what's been put in front of you, but you do have a choice about your focus. And, and that will so, solve a lot of things. Another brother, this is uh, John Trapp from many years ago. Lustfully, he warns of lustfully considering her beauty till my heart be hot as an oven with lawless lust and my body on fire with abominable filth. Look upon the woeful chain of David's lust and remember also how many have died of the wound in the eye. It started with the eye. And so David, uh, Job makes a covenant with his eye. He made a vow, he made a promise that with his own eyes he would not look upon a woman in a sinful way. Uh, the covenant is made with God so far as controlling his eyes. So what's our eyes connected to? Heart. The heart. In Matthew fifteen nineteen, for out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, theft, false witness, blasphemies. In Matthew twelve thirty four. O generation of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak good things for out of the heart? And that got cut off. I thought it was written, but out of the heart precedes all this stuff. So, I don't know that because of this covenant, I think Job is made of the similar stuff as we're made. So I don't know that this means that he never lusted again. But he had control of it. He was winning the battles. And he would, I believe, keep short accounts with God. Certainly that's what we need to do. 
uh, one of the most important times to, to, to put on the armor of God is after you've just fallen because you didn't have on the armor of God. And to rest in God's forgiveness. Uh, he did not dwell in the lustful things. Once you start going down that hill, uh, you can get to a point of no return. Whether it's forgiveness or whether it's something else or whether it's especially, I think sometimes for men, if it's sexual lust, we, we look for an excuse, we blame someone, or maybe we just don't take it uh, as serious as we should. Um, one of the Puritans said of Job, he restrained himself from the very thoughts and desires of filthiness with such persons, wherewith the generality of men allowed themselves to commit gross fornication, as deeming it to either be none but a very little sin. And so we, we tend to minimize the sin. But Job understood that lusting after a beautiful woman was not in the allotment of what God had ordained for him. And her nakedness did not belong to him. And in Leviticus 18, 1 through 18, there's a whole list of people that are outside the bounds of what is right and legal and holy and good for you and I to be involved in seeing nakedness. If you've not read that lately, just make a note, Leviticus 18, 1 through 18, list a whole bunch of people there. And, uh, you know, this, this is off limits, no fishing, no looking. If, if I'm looking upon the nakedness of a woman that is not my wife, I'm looking upon that and partaking of that which does not belong to me. Now, this is a serious battle. You don't have to have a magazine open. You don't have to be looking at something on the Internet or on your cell phone. It can all be in your mind. It can all be in your mind. And I think that we, we, we've not, we've, we, we're going to talk a little bit about pornography. But I don't think, I don't think I've thought much about that if I allow lust in my mind and Im images in my mind, that's it's pornography. I'm, I'm partaking of that which is not mine. Job didn't have to deal with the Pornography that we have today. I'm sure they had it. The, the people who've done research have shown how that on the artistic images that were available in ancient times, there's all kinds of uh, pornographic images. But we need to take just a minute to get stunned, if that's possible. Uh, there's an there is an, 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 um, a website called Covenant Eyes that is designed to help win these battles. If by the grace of God this is not a major problem for you or not an ongoing problem or not a something you've got to be on the alert for, uh, I'm happy for you. Um, but you don't have to be going to all those places to run into it. You can just uh, be doing your normal thing. But this is the world we live in. We're not going to change the world. But we can follow the example of Job to make a covenant with our eyes. That's what's, in our, that's what's on our plate. That's what we can do. And that's what we must do. So, uh, you know, that nakedness doesn't belong to me. It's not in God's allotment. Verse, thir verse 3, 
Is it not destruction for the wicked and disaster for the workers of iniquity? The context here of Job's self-control, when it came to lust, he also considered the destructive nature of allowing oneself to be aroused. He's not just looking out there. He's aware that if I go down this road, it's not going to be good. So, another quote. It is much more difficult for a man to choose satisfaction with the allotment of God from above and to avoid the destruction and disaster Job spoke of. Nevertheless, by the power of God's Spirit, it can be done. And obedience to God in this arena is a precious, wonderful sacrifice made unto him, a genuine way to present our bodies as living sacrifices unto him, Romans 12, uh, 1 and 2. And so that, that's the mindset I've got to have. Now, this is a similar mindset to winning any spiritual battle. Then in verse 4, he says, Does not he see all my ways and count all my steps? Uh, it was helpful for Job to consider that God's eyes were upon him. Here's a quote. Most men indulge in, God, in ungodly visual arousal with the at least temporary delusion that their conduct is unseen by God. This is, how, this is true with all sin, or certainly with most sin. Well, my house is my castle, and what goes on here is nobody's business but mine. It helped Job to know that God was always watching. It'll help you and I. And that's um, we, I don't know if it was here or some other setting. Uh, plugging in here two different excellent uh, definitions of the fear of God. The fear of the Lord is affectionate reverence by which the child of God humbly and carefully bends himself to the Father's will and law. The fear of the Lord is continual awareness that I am in the presence of the holy, just, and almighty God, and that every word, thought, deed, and action is open before him and judged by him. You know, we, we sometimes we use the term, maybe not enough, preach the gospel to yourself. Well, in preaching the gospel to yourself, you're not just preaching the gospel of the death, the burial, the resurrection of Christ, repent, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's foundational. Yes, never minimize that. But flowing out of this, this is gospel. This is good news. Uh, the fear of the Lord, a holy, righteous fear of the Lord is good news. And so you can't open the Bible, but you're going to find gospel, good news. This is the way you walk in it. This is the glory of who God is. And so in a war zone like we live in, um, we need to consider these things. We're going to read... 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 and 20. You see that? And then comment from that. This is a verse to have hid in our hearts so that in the moment of temptation, uh, we have the power of the word of God, the shield of faith to raise up, to quench the fiery darts of the evil one, um, you know, sometimes when we have a divided heart, we want to make the way of the cross, the way of Christ, to be complicated. And as I was meditating on all this, I happen to think of the verse, I can't remember if it's in Psalms or Proverbs, I think it's Proverbs, that says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. How simple is that? It's not complicated revolutionary 
shows the power of the Word of God and every, everything that we'll say or can say about winning a spiritual battle is going to take us to the Word of God and there's going to have to be the hiding of the Word of God in our heart. Is that what Jesus did? I mean, Satan in... He didn't send a, one of his demons. Satan himself is tempting Jesus. And Jesus just pulls out the word, just hear it in his heart. Pulls up the shield of faith. Boom. The power of the word of God by the spirit of God. So, this is a, a strong, powerful verse. And 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 and 20. What? Know you not that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you're not your own, for you're bought with a price? Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Romans 6. Shall I continue to sin that grace may abound? God forbid. So speaking the truth, speaking forth the word of God, hiding it in our heart, speaking it forth. So follow along. We're going to read major portions of this section. Um, I've gone through this many times. I did not need it any less this week as I was going over it than I needed it before. I'm still in a war zone. I still have the capacity to sin. I need to be hiding God's word in my heart. I need to be telling myself the truth. All who are in Christ, middle of page five, you're bought with a price. We're not our own. Spurgeon said, last paragraph, look you back to the day when you were bought, when you were bond slaves to your sin, when you were under the just sentence of divine justice, when it was inevitable that God should punish your transgressions. Remember how the Son of God became your substitute, how he bare his back to the lash that should have fallen upon you and laid his soul beneath the sword which should have quenched its fury in your blood. That's a powerful quote. To hide in our heart. You say, well, that's not a scripture, but it's based on scripture. And boy, it's, it's very important. Bought with a price. You're redeemed with the precious blood of Christ. Spurgeon again, top of page six. That the blood of Christ was shed to buy our souls from death and hell is a wonder of compassion which ought to overwhelm us with adoring love for Christ. Christ's death was to substitute for the death of the ungodly. He was made a curse for us, and the presence of God was denied him because of it. Beholding, behold the suffering Lamb of God. Open the pages of Scripture and meditate deeply of Christ at Gethsemane and Golgotha. One of the most profound things that you and I can remind ourselves when we're walking up to temptation. You may be walking in a situation where duty demands that you have to be there, but you know it's going to be a temptation. It may be a person you have to work with. And so you need, to, and I need to remind myself, I've been bought with a price. I belong to him. It can be around church folk. It can be around your, your spouse. And naturally, there are some odds and there are some conflict. But for yourself, you focus on yourself and so as for myself. I've been bought with the price of the blood of Jesus. He's to be glorified. So in the middle of page six, the most significant event in all of my personal past is I've been bought with the precious blood of Christ. I'm not my own. I belong to Jesus. The most significant reality in all of my experience in the present is that I am in Christ and Christ is in me. And then on page seven, the most significant thing about my future is that I will continue to experience the ongoing cleansing power of Jesus, past, present, and future the most significant thing about us. We are bought with Christ's precious blood. We are his temple. Know ye not that you are the temple of God and the spirit of God dwells in you. 
You are the temple of the living God. We know that when Jesus came, he dwelt among us. First John, oh, in John, the Gospel of John 1.14. He tabernacled among us. Where is he now? Well, he's seated in heaven. But he is also Christ in us. Page 8. You, child of God, are his holy temple on earth. You, dear assembly of saints, you're his holy temple. Alan Redpath said, if you refuse the implication of his claim upon you, then what business have you to hide in the shelter of John 3.16? You cannot have the grace of God without the government of God. The price of his blood demands a practical surrender of my body. I'm no longer mine. I've been bought with a price. He has the right to be glorified through my body. You cannot, God cannot dwell in the soul without corresponding influences. Now, I want to get to page 9 because this is, in dealing with 1 Corinthians 6, 15 through 20, where God has been warning against various sexual sins, John MacArthur wrote, one of the best things I've ever seen on this. It's very powerful. Christ's people are one spirit with him. We have been looking at some of the wondrous implications of that statement. But for his purpose here, Paul uses it to show that a Christian who commits sexual immorality involves his Lord. Now, this is something we never think about. We think about feeding our flesh, Many times people with anger and resentments are prime subjects to fall for sexual pleasure. But any kind of sexual immorality is involving our Lord. All sex outside of marriage is sin, but when it is committed by believers, it is especially reprehensible because it profanes Jesus Christ with whom the believer is one. It places Christ in an unthinkable position. Christ is not personally tainted with the sin, but his reputation is dirtied because his temple on earth, you and I, is partaking of filth. Furthermore, although sexual sin is not necessarily the worst sin, it is the most unique it is most unique in its character. It rises from within the body, bent on personal gratification. It drives like no other impulse, and when fulfilled, it affects the body like no other sin. It has a way of internally destroying a person that no other sin has. Because sexual intimacy is the deepest uniting of two persons, its misuse corrupts the deepest human level. That's not a psychological analysis, but divine revealed truth. And you can look up the verses there to see that amplified further. He goes on to say on the last page that we have here, page 10, sexual immorality is far more destructive than alcohol, far more destructive than drugs, far more destructive than crime. To commit sexual sin in a church auditorium, as disgusting as that is, it would be no worse than committing it somewhere else. Offense is made within God's sanctuary. See, we're his sanctuary. This building is not his sanctuary. We are. Offense is made within God's sanctuary whenever and wherever sexual immorality is committed by believers. Every act of fornication, every act of adultery by Christians is committed in God's sanctuary, their own bodies. Sin is sin, but sexual sin is unique. Nothing like it on the face of the earth. Because it's also a violation of the fact that in Ephesians we're told, uh, so I won't mess it up, Ephesians 5. He's talking about husband-wife roles. And so he says... For this uh, chapter 5, beginning verse 21, well, let's just start with verse 30. We are members of his body, of his flesh, and his bones. For this cause, 
shall a man leave father and mother, and they shall be joined, he shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery. But I speak to you concerning Christ and the church. He's teaching about husband-wife relationships. But he says, what I'm really teaching you about is the relationship between Christ and the church. It's one of the reasons why marriage is so sacred is because God has ordained that it be a visual of the intimacy between Christ and the church. The church is sacred. And when you as a Christian engage in the act of marriage with your wife, God, is ordained, God is, has orchestrated this to where it's pleasurable. God has ordained in the husband-wife relationship that this is a, the most intimate love expression in the world. And if you're here and you're not married, or you're here and you don't have a spouse, or you've never been married or whatever, uh, it's very important for you as well to have God's view about all this. It will give you great strength to do things in God's order. So, uh, quite interesting that in the book of Job, we've been through all of this stuff, and Job says, I made a covenant with my eyes not to look upon a woman in lust. He made a decisive decision that was followed up every day of his life. It's not just a one and done. It's a commitment that goes on and on and on and on. And it will serve us well. It will bring glory to God. And will bring an attitude of causing us to have great, give great honor uh, to, our, to our wives. Don't underestimate your own flesh. Let me not underestimate my own flesh. Let me, here's a godly man. And God said he's the godliest man on the face of the earth at that time. And this godly man knew the power of this temptation. And so he made a covenant to stay on top of it. So there's a little bit more to Job than we think. To God be the glory. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the power that you give us to win spiritual battles on any and every front. We confess that we have failed on many fronts, not for lack of resources, not for lack of proper weapons, but for our own faulty commitment. And Father, we thank you that for the child of God, failure is never final. For all the failures that this godly man Job had, you kept working with him and brought him to a place of deep repentance that he had never known and deep restoration. We thank you that you continue to mercifully and graciously work with us. I pray for the Spirit of God to give us anointing and grace to everyone here for whatever their great temptation looks like. We thank you that you are sufficient. We've been bought with the blood of Jesus Christ. We belong to him. And the Spirit of God is within us to manifest the life of Christ. I thank you that, Lord, we don't have to whine and moan and say, well, I'm not Jesus because Jesus lives within us by his spirit, and we can and we must win spiritual battles. And for this we pray in Jesus' name, amen.